This morning, it is absolutely my great pleasure to welcome Lisa, Dr. Lisa Kimball with us. Uh, Lisa has been one of the best uh, seminary professors I've had, and her classes were absolutely amazing and so interactive. Uh, it was a true joy, and uh, it's, an, it's a really great pleasure to have Lisa with us. Uh, Lisa is an Associate Dean for, of Lifelong Learning at the Virginia Theological Seminary. Uh, she has focused her teaching uh, and research on lifelong, life deep and life wide discipleship and Christian vocation in contemporary and global and post institutional context. Uh, Lisa is really keen and passionate about a lay leadership in the church and that's something absolutely amazing about her ministry to the church. Uh, prior to joining this uh, VTS, uh, Lisa served on the faculty of a number of theological seminaries across the country and also worked for two of our Episcopal dioceses and five congregations in California and Minnesota. And it is absolutely my pleasure to have Lisa with us. I'm so thrilled about it. Thank you for joining us, Lisa. And one thing before we go also that I will mention that I absolutely loved. Uh, when we were talking about this session, Lisa asked me whether I could um, donate the funds that we would otherwise uh, give to Lisa to the mission of the Navajo land. Uh, and, um, and that's just uh, absolutely amazing. And also I'm pleased to say that our Artish committee has decided to donate $500 of their own towards their mission. Uh, so we will be in total uh, supporting the Nav Navajo land by $700 this uh, this time. And um, and uh, Leon Sampson, Reverend Leon Sampson is actually a friend of mine from seminary. And I, I'm hoping that we might actually start a um, good connection going forward. Um, so thank you, Lisa, for organically starting it off for us. Well, thank you. Um... That just delights me. I can't tell you how, how important that is. I spent many years serving various congregations in the Diocese of California, which are all in Province 8, so the western part of the state country uh, of the Episcopal Church, and Navajo land has always been a very active part of that region. And so as a youth minister, so this speaks to you, John, um, as a youth minister for many, many years, and at one point the provincial youth coordinator for Province 8, I spent a lot of real hours on the ground in Navajo land and with young people from the Navajo communities, um, from the Navajo nation. And it that has always been just a, a place of deep importance for me and knowing the, the extraordinary poverty and struggle that they have for access to resources, particularly during COVID. Uh, this just seemed like a, a no brainer, you know? So thank you all for, for honoring that. I really appreciate it. Um, it is delightful. Let me just check, we're here till 11, right? Is that correct? Yes, and Ish. so Is that right? okay. exactly, exactly. So the way okay. uh, we, uh, for everyone's uh, information, uh, now I will hand it over to Lisa. Lisa will have the, her own uh, presentation, and then uh, we will start in a Q and A session. I will ask uh, an initial question. I think Andy might have one as well, and then we will release it to everyone. And we absolutely want everyone's uh, involvement in this. So please, please, if you have questions, uh, just keep them for you. We can ask them later on. Could I just um, offer a word of welcome? I'm sorry I just got back in from dealing with our major technical issues this morning. Sorry about that, folks. We're hoping our service will be available around 11 o'clock on YouTube or Facebook, uh, but it's just you know, uh, one of those things. Lisa, thank you for being with us. I I'm, I'm so delighted that you are able to, um, to spend some time with us and share your amazing wisdom and insight and your, and your faith and understanding mm -hmm. of, of the Christian journey. Um, I'm canonically resident still in the Diocese of Alabama. I've, I've been here for about 15 months, um, but I'm so grateful for the work you've done in my, in my home diocese. Um, everyone is just talking about what a difference this has made and, and how meaningful it is. So it, it is just wonderful that Matthew has this relationship with you and we could get you here with us today. Thank you so much for being with us. Well, oh, you're, you're very welcome. And I hope I live up to all this, but I'm just, I am so grateful to be here. Uh, so among the things that sometimes are used to describe me is a slightly less flattering commitment to baptism. I've heard people say she's rabid about baptism. Uh, and that probably is because I have been called, as it turns out, um, although I didn't always know it at the time, 
to ministry in the wider church and in local Christian congregations, mostly within the Episcopal Church, um, as a layperson for all of my life. And much of that early on was all volunteer and then over the years became more professional and more paid, part-time, very teeny bit part-time. But as I've lived into who God has called me to be as a baptized person and to be baptized in a denomination that takes four orders very seriously, right? Baptism is the beginning of our journey. Uh, we recognize the fullness of the priesthood of all believers. And we have the ordination of deacons who are called to a very particular ministry that I believe is essential, particularly in the 21st century. Um, we can say more about that. That's a whole nother topic. We have the order of priests who are to represent Christ to us in our local and particular Christian communities and are to remind us in our gathered form of the sacraments and the tradition to teach and to preach and to reconcile us. And then we have our bishops, right, around whom we organize ourselves. Um, we are an episcopate. We are, we are people who gather around this, this remarkable body of Christ that we understand to be ecclesially organized around the wisdom of a bishop. So I, as a layperson in that mix, it has been a privilege all of my life uh, to have the freedom to get up each morning and to say yes to God. I am not tethered to the church because I have a collar around my neck. I'm tethered to God because of promises that were made on my behalf at a baptismal font way back. So before I go on, I would love for those of you who have your cameras on right now, put your hand up or something to tell me if you were baptized as an infant. I'm just curious to know among us, I certainly was. Okay, that's great to see. And then those of you who were baptized maybe as a teenager or young adult, anybody in that window? Oh, wow, look at you. So you have some actual memory of your baptism. Was anybody <clears throat> baptized as an older adult? Not in this group, that's not a problem, but to have that continuum is exciting to me. Um, I believe profoundly, and you do too, I expect, if you stop and think about it, that baptism is not membership. Baptism is much more than membership to a club. Um, it's much more than your, your sort of card of belonging to a particular institution. Uh, it is much more than a ticket to Eucharist even though there is a relationship between baptism and receiving Eucharist. It's not, it's not something that is a technical requirement. It's not something that can be reduced to um, a sense of obligation that does not change us. Baptism is a process that begins with God and continues through the transmission of faith in the family, the household, we hope, in the body of Christ, the church, and we are brought to the fullness of our baptized identities in that Christian community. And then that identity that is formed at the font becomes an identity that we live out throughout the course of our lives. And in the course of our lives, each of us is called to unique ministry. Each of us has particular gifts for ministry that are essential to making that body of Christ complete. And it's so important that we see baptism in its fullness, in its continuing invitation to each of us to grow closer and deeper in relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's not a once off, I happen to have been baptized when I was an infant, but I am still figuring out what this means. I'm still depending on other people who are wiser than I am by far about the Christian life. And together, we become who God wants us to be, right? So I believe, because I've seen it, that when congregations like yours, like, excuse me, <clears throat> the Episcopal Church in Falls Church, like if you yourselves truly take the authority of the baptized seriously, if you seriously think about and live into the theology of our baptism, which we'll talk about in just a minute, the whole congregation benefits the congregation becomes a vital community that witnesses to hope, to healing, to justice, to resurrection in the world around it. And it all starts at baptism. We, can, we will go back to being just another good, well-intentioned organization or club if we see baptism simply as a tick 
on a, bar, a piece of paper that happened once and was put away after, and then we maybe had a nice party. Um, it's, it's something much more powerful than that. And I would argue much more radical. And before I switch to some slides, I wanna say that in a strange way, um, your technology difficulties this morning, your technical difficulties, that's a gift to us all right now as we think about baptism. That was a glaring reminder, right? That we are finite, that we are not in control, that we are utterly dependent on God, that we are utterly dependent on each other to try to discern how to be more like God, that God is with us in the mess. Look, we all still showed up for forum, right? This is still church. There will be a service that you can choose to watch later that your clergy and lay leaders faithfully recorded for you. But that was a reminder to me, and I hope to you, that we're on a journey together and that the temptation to think that we're in control, the temptation to think that we can get it right, the temptation to think that as Christians, we're not supposed to make mistakes. Those are the barriers that lead us to living a less full identity as a baptized Christian than we are called to. It's not that I wish trouble on you. It's not that like the comment in the chat that I think I'm not sure was it Robin made about, oh my gosh, this is taking us back to 2020. Those are all real emotions, right? As human persons, the neuroscientists now know that we are hardwired for anxiety. That's our primal brain. We we are first and foremost, so reptilian is often what's said, right? That we will flee danger. We will seek hunger. We will seek shelter. Those are urgent needs to be a thriving body, human person. But they also know we are hardwired for hope. And so in moments like today, when everything seems to go wrong, we have both, right? We have anxiety, uncertainty, dilemma, frightened, anger, all that, right? But we more fundamentally, when we see each other's faces again, when we are remembered as the body of Christ, we reclaim our identity as the people of God who believe that Christ died and rose again for us in the resurrection. So tiny example, but it's a concrete example, right? Of, of our finitude, our limits, however perfect our technology may seem, we are interdependent and ultimately dependent on God. And one of my favorite phrases that keeps me going in the moments when everything seems to go haywire or hard is that somehow by grace, God breaks through. God knows how to handle us. And this gets close to the book you, some of you have read and some of you are reading. I believe you're reading Rowan Williams, Being Christian, particularly in the chapter on baptism. We're going to talk about this too, but he, he talks about the baptized are people who go into the chaos. We find Jesus in the chaos. We find Jesus on the margins. We find Jesus where we are perhaps most uncertain and most afraid and most needing of that promise of love in the midst of the tension. So with that, let me make a little shift here to some slides and give you a couple of quick thoughts. So that's where I'm from, you know that. Um, I, this is a phrase I love, soaking souls. I think that, that dryness of baptism being thought of only as a moment. Um, that limitation is just broken open when I think about being just walking wet in the world. Like what does it really mean to be wildly uh, wet and promised to be Christ's own forever because of baptism? So soaking souls is where I'd like you to think about and carry with you today as you go forward. I said I was baptized. Um, I was baptized in 1959, give you a sense of my age. I was, this is the closest picture I could find. That's a, about six months old. I was probably about three months old. I was baptized in the parish in the top two parts of this frame. It's called St. Clement's Episcopal Church in Berkeley, California. And of course I have no physical memory of it, but lots of stories. And one of them is that my father who had grown up nominally Christian, I would say, um, but with a loving congregational Christian family in Berkeley, was received by the bishop who baptized me into the, actually was confirmed by the bishop who baptized me into the Episcopal Church on that same morning that I was baptized. 
So the very day that I was baptized, there was a bishop in the house, there were priests in the house. I don't know if there was a deacon in the house. I want to believe there was. And my dad came from being a sort of nominal Christian as a congregational church member to, and really member, to a, a very novice Episcopalian. And that all happened because of my mother. My mother who knew how deeply she had been formed in the Episcopal tradition had invited her now husband and now her new child into this life together. And I will never drive by that church or talk to people who have histories in that congregation and not be grateful for what happened that day and for what surrounded it. Now, alongside of that, were very conventional roles for godparents. If you remember and you're like me and that generation, the kind of tradition that was handed on was that if I was a female baby, which I was, that I would typically have two female godparents and one male. I don't know why that math was decided that way, but it was Trinitarian perhaps, a little gender balance, I'm not sure. But as a result, my godparents are, or were, they're deceased now, many of them, my mother's older sister, who turned out to be both um, rigorous and mean about my being a, her goddaughter. She would send me these like very sort of demanding handwritten letters if I hadn't written a thank you note for something she gave me. Uh, she would sort of be cryptic about her, her judgment of the way I was spending my time as a teenager. As I got to know her as an adult, I loved her dearly. And she said, I was your godmother. I had to take it very seriously. And the other two were my father's law school best friend and his wife. Um, again, good people. None of those three at the time that I was baptized were really active in the church, to be honest. They had all grown up in Christian communities. They were all members somewhere in some congregation. But typical of the 1950s, I would say, um, they were the right people. They were socially in the right spheres. And one of the things that I would talk more about if we had more time is the significance of godparents. That's actually what I wrote my PhD dissertation on. If you as a person or you as a congregation can do anything to deepen your congregation's awareness of the significance of baptism, I would encourage you to start to pay attention to two things, your own baptismal story. Like after today, start remembering your story and tell somebody else and ask them about theirs. So remember the story, remember who was involved. Imagine if you don't know or ask or think about why were they chosen? What was the significance of each of those people? And then the other I would do is reinvigorate the tradition of godparents. So often we have godparents and just as I described mine, they're good people in our family or extended community. And they may remember us on certain holidays or anniversaries. But is there a faith relationship in that relationship? Do we talk about God? Do we talk about where, what we're experiencing of our spiritual lives with each other? Encourage people to reach out, even if it's been 20, 30, 40 years, to their godparents and rekindle that relationship. Add godparents and baptismal sponsors to your prayers of the people on occasion so that people who are praying with you hear that term and go, oh, I'm a godparent. Maybe I should reach out to my godchild or I haven't thought about my godparents, or they name their godparents by name. That's also part of the body of Christ that is formed at baptism, and that is part of the ongoing discipleship and formation that each of us truly, truly needs and honors. So I encourage you to think deeply about who you are and when you were baptized, tell others about that story, and then think about godparents and your role as one or what it will mean if you help others, like young children you have now who may be considering the baptism of their children. How do you help them choose people who will walk alongside in covenant relationship around what was promised at the font? So what I want you to think about is that we have a life as baptized Christians that is grounded in vows, right? It's grounded in promises. And for many people, even people active in church, when I say the word vow, I say, you know, what's at the core of your being? What are the promises you've made that really shape your daily life? When they're very honest, and I hope they will be when you ask them the similar question or think of it yourself, the things that bubble up are sometimes not at all about their Christian identity. The first thing someone might say is my commitment to being sober. That has saved my life. Someone might say, 
I was an alcoholic. I, I was at the end of my rope. My marriage was breaking up. I was losing contact with my children and I was helped to sobriety. And there's a story and being sober and promising that I will do what I can one day at a time has absolutely reoriented my life. Someone else may say their marriage vows, that their covenant commitment to another person is that which shapes and changes their vows, their way of being every day. Someone else will tell me, I don't know if it's a vow, but my commitment to my children, my commitment to put their well being first, that feels like an orienting promise. Some people will say, I'm an attorney. You know, I've taken, I have promised um, on a Bible to protect the Constitution, to do certain things that are essential to my vocation and my career and my profession. And I think about them every day because there are ethical standards that I have to engage. Others are physicians, others are teachers. People will talk about what's at the core of their identity that shapes who they are. It's important for us as Christians to realize if we take baptism seriously, then we are grounded in vows. We are grounded in promises that we made and that were made on our behalf by a community of faithful people. And I think the greatest gift we can give us as Christian people in community is to revisit those vows on a regular basis. But we tend, and this is just my experience, I don't know if it's yours, we tend to, in the Episcopal Church, focus on the baptismal covenant, which is beautiful, it's based on the creed, right? To focus on the promises of how we will be, how we will act, in a sense that we want very much to become that, the aspirational goodness of what's in that covenant. And I experience us as more reluctant to look at that from which we have turned away, more reluctant to think about what we had to renounce. So as you think about what vow or vows have shaped your life, I'm gonna be encouraging you also to be thinking about, and what do you have to give up to honor those vows? What have you turned away from in order to prioritize the good, the commitment, the covenant, the promise that you have made? This is the book you've been reading. Um, I have so much I could say about Rowan Williams, but I am deeply grateful for his life and witness to us. And as God would be God, his writing, his teaching, his leadership as the Archbishop of Canterbury formerly, um, I think came at a prescient moment for our church, our church universal, our Anglican communion. We live, as you know, in a fragile time of skepticism and disbelief in the world. And we need people like Rowan Williams who lay out for us a tradition that is rich, inviting, and compelling. So I am so glad you're reading this book. And I just want to show you a couple of the phrases in the early chapter on baptism that I think are, are very worth paying attention to. The beginning of the Christian life is a new beginning of God's creative work. He talks about echoing the creation story. It's God at work in us, right? We're not doing this ourselves. It is by grace and by wonder that we become more fully who God created us to be. And what's so powerful about baptism is that we set aside all that gets in the way of who God wants us to be. And the Imago Dei, the image of God, the likeness of God in us is what is centered. It is so exciting, but it's a beginning and we live this life in community. So to be baptized is to recover the humanity that God first intended. We are being baptized into a rhythm that Christ himself lived, that we only get to this new life through death. We are plunged into water and need to die to our old selves in order to recover the fullness of the goodness that God created in us. And then the phrase that I mentioned earlier, Christians will be found in the neighborhood of Jesus, in the chaos. So this idea that being Christian and baptized is this salvation, this promise that I'm going to be fine, it's good with me and God, you know, I don't have to worry about anything, or the prosperity gospel that if I just believe enough, I'll get rich, I won't get sick, everybody I love will be fine. We all know that's not true. What we know more deeply in our souls, remember anxiety and hope? 
we know that if we're honest, God has broken through in our deepest moments of suffering. God can break through through the gentle touch of someone else. God does break through through medical care or some other kind of miraculous healing when we least expect it. And we also know that God is there with us when the suffering continues, when people, we or others are really left with no apparent solution, no apparent easy way out. There is something there that is deeper and more eternal than anything that this world can provide. So then, what does it mean for us to be fully Christian in this world that is complicated, right? What is the vantage point that God has given us because we actually are baptized at the font? How do we see the world differently? And how do we respond differently to this world where it is much more common for people to want to do it their own way, to want to pull away from any kind of confidence in the divine. We're these crazy alternative people these days, which I find very freeing, to be honest. We are no longer conventional. We can't just assume that North America is Christian, much less a Christian of our vein, our tradition. Uh, we have work to do, folks if we are going to live into the fullness of our baptismal identity and be the body of Christ in Falls Church and beyond, then we need to dig in. We need to roll up our sleeves. We need to figure out who each of us is called to be uniquely. What is the gift you have that nobody else has right now for listening, for prayer, for knitting, for gathering up that food, for going out on a cold morning, for calling a neighbor, for being attentive to the needs of people on the margins. What are the gifts you have that God is stirring in you? So many people um, who are church people and good people have really tried to be Christian, but we have been so shallow in our expression of this hope, this radical identity of baptismal Christian living. It isn't easy. And when people want it to look easy and we have 15 minute preparation for a baptism and then we have a much longer and bigger party with a huge cake after the service than we focused on in the service. When people come into church on a Sunday and say, oh, it's a baptism, oh shucks, that's gonna make it longer. When we start to say, you know, we, as the congregation gathered that we witnessed these vows and we promised to do all in our power to support this person in their life in Christ, but we don't even know their name and we're never going to see them again. Those are fragments of what it can be to be the body of Christ. They're not the fullness of what it means to be the body of Christ. We really have work to do to raise the bar, not to make it exclusive, not to be elitist about our beliefs, but to be confident that the promises we are making are promises that lead people to living water not the false promises of worldly success or of instantaneous gratification. We need to recognize that there is so much more to this journey than the loneliness, the fear that so many people have in the world. We are called to address that systemically, as we would say. We are called to address what it means to be the body of Christ in a world that is thirsty for good news, a world that is aching for hope. And they're not quick fixes, folks. It's work each of us has to do on our own baptismal identity so that we together can be a baptized community in Christ and be bold, be courageous, be, be absolutely audacious when it comes to the claims we make about welcoming the stranger, about respecting difference, all the things that we know to be gospel truths, we know in a world that, like North America, US, how religiously polarized we are, how politically polarized we are. Your congregation has been broken open by polarization. You are this faithful group of people who have recognized that there is healing and love and hope and reconciliation available to you only in the gospel. How do we share that out of our baptismal identity so that the world recognizes that the promises we made at the font 
really changed us. And that we're not just a nice person in a Hallmark card waving at somebody. We're someone who is in solidarity with them. We will walk with them through prayer and sacramental life and witness and sacrifice to support all people thriving because God created all of the world in God's image. And God desires that all beings will thrive and know love. So our charge is really big. We do not want for this desert world to be the experience that people have of their daily lives or tragically of the church. You know, maybe I know for sure that there are women and men in congregations today faithfully showing up online right now, but gathered in person when we can, who when I take them aside, are not being fed by their experience of church. They are not at the core hopeful about what it means to be Christian. They're there because they're good people, because they promised they would be, because they're on a committee, because they're on the vestry, because they were asked to do something. And doing something feels good. It feels great to contribute. And I don't mean to minimize that. But at the core, their own spiritual life is parched. And they are longing for living water. They are longing for their soul to be soaked in the baptismal promises that make all life new. So if you are parched, may their brother or sister in Christ who is near you share their living water with you. And if you have living water, please, by the grace of God, share it with others. The vows we make are, are only made, as I said, after we renounce some things. And what's interesting about the three renunciations in our baptismal liturgy is that they echo Christ's own temptations in the wilderness. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. And if you want these slides, I will be glad to share them. But you'll see here the three temptations of Christ at the top of the frame and the three renunciations that are spoken in our baptismal liturgy. You may have all the kingdoms of the world if you fall down and worship me. What does Jesus say? away with you, Satan. Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. So we are asked, do you renounce Satan and all the spiritual forces of wickedness that rebel against God? And we say, I renounce them. And similarly, he's invited to command stones to become loaves of bread. And we are asked, do you renounce the evil powers of this world? which corrupt and destroy the creatures of God. I renounce them. Well, then throw yourself down from the pinnacle and let the angels catch you. If you're some superhuman, you know, prove yourself. What does Jesus say? Do not put the Lord your God to the test. We answer, do you renounce all sinful desires that draw you from the love of God? The temptation to self-satisfaction, the temptation to doing it yourself, the temp temptation to think that we should be right, that we should know how, that we have all the power we need. I renounce them. And then, then only do we turn, literally, metanoia, turn to Jesus Christ in order to accept him as our role model, as our savior, the one who died and rose for us, because God has shown us through the life of Jesus that we too can be saved through a death to evil, a death to distorted power, a death to the evils that are in this world in order for us to claim the love of God that is absolutely promised to all of creation. So we turn to Jesus and we accept him as our Lord and Savior. We put away our whole, we put our whole trust in his grace and his love. And we promise to follow and obey him as our Lord. The language of sin and Satan and Lord and grace is language we need to use. It matters. It matters that we are baptized people. It matters that we are people who deeply believe that God is transforming us at baptism for a vocation in the world that matters. 
So will you who witness these vows? This is our communal part, right? We may have been baptized as I was in 1959, but every time I witness a baptism, my own baptismal vocation should be stirred. And my standard for what I have to be as a Christian rises. I have to do more because now I have to witness to yet another person's life in Christ. I have to support this person's promise. Have any of us ever walked up to someone privately and suggested that we're concerned that what we see about the way their life is going, that it's not resonant with their baptismal vows? What would that conversation look like? What would it look like to invite one another into an accountability that is anchored in what we promised at the font? Because we truly promised to walk together in solidarity. We truly promised to witness to each other. And therefore, we promise to be the body of Christ in this place together. And we go on to renew our own baptismal covenant. This phrase, um, I think, says a lot about who you're called to be. The baptized life is characterized by solidarity with those in need and sharing with all others who believe. Rowan Williams, page 11. We're not alone in this, right? We don't get made a Christian by ourselves. We don't become a more aware and generous Christian by ourselves. The gifts that we have are discerned in community. The gifts we have are affirmed in community and the needs of the world are recognized together. I have blind spots. There are things I will never see or hear without the help of somebody else. And you have gifts to see some of those. What are the ways in which we together share what we believe and then also share who it is we're called to be in the world that is aching, that is dry, that is desperate for the good news that you have to offer? I think I'm going to stop it there so we make sure we have time for questions. And if there's time, I have a little video to share with you at the end. Thank you, Lisa, so much for this wonderful introduction to both Rowan Williams for us and this journey with uh, Rowan uh, across Lent and into the fundamentals of our faith. And so maybe I'll just start off, start off with one question for you, Lisa. Um, we believe as baptized Christians uh, that we essentially identify with Jesus's ministry of the prophetic, priestly and uh, royal ministry in the world. Um, for many of us coming from uh, Roman Catholicism like myself or some, uh, some other traditions, it may be a little tricky to wrap uh, our heads around the fact that in our Episcopal Catechism or Anglican Catechism, uh, the ministers of the church are the lay people, deacons, priests, and bishops. And so you are someone who is so passionate about the role of the laity in the church. How do you see the laity leave, living into this priestly ministry of Jesus in the world? First of all, those of us who are lay people, there's 99.2% of the Episcopal Church that are laity. So we got, we've got some power in numbers, folks. Um, not that priestly ministry is, is a forced ministry, um, but I think it's important to remember the, the ratios, right? Because it's very easy for the church to become unhealthily clerical, not because we are suspicious of clergy. We need clergy and we need people who are lay people to discern among us who is called to the various orders of ordination. But I do think because it's hard for institutions uh, not to become hierarchical, we can default to expressions of our belief structure that do not actually match our ecclesiology. We, we believe things differently than we live in daily practice, which is where baptismal theology comes back in. Um, I think that priestly, my vocation as a baptized Christian is priestly in my bridge building with other Christians. So I think even Rowan Williams talks a little about this, that we are called as, that priests are called to bridge, to reconcile, to, to create, uh, to reconnect the parts of the body of Christ. As a baptized Christian, like I said earlier, you know, we don't have a, we don't have, as just a lay person, baptized Christian, we don't have a collar around our neck, right? We may wear a cross. We may have other signifiers for people who are watching our lives that we're a Christian. But we have to be known for our actions in the world. 
And I think the way we are priestly is our willingness to show up where we find ourselves and witness to these promises in ways that are radically different from the dominant culture we may find ourselves in. Let me give you a concrete example. My wife was in the hospital last week, unexpectedly. Uh, she went in Shrove Tuesday night and was there till Thursday night. And so Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, right? So I participated in the seminary's Ash Wednesday service online in the morning and then went over to the hospital for visiting hours in the afternoon. And I took a little vial of ashes that had been given to us, distributed to us to use in our homes. I took them with me to administer ashes to her in bed and to share the service with her online, which had been recorded. One of the nurses saw me doing that. And she said, could I have ashes? And I said, absolutely. So I hadn't gone in expecting to administer ashes to anybody else, but I stood up and her first question was, are you a priest? And I said, no, she said, are you a pastor? And I said, I paused and I said, no, probably not in the sense you mean, but I'm baptized. And then she just smiled, like the smile that went from ear to ear. And I administered ashes and I said, remember that you are dust and to dust you shall return. And I prayed a prayer for her about a holy Lent. And it just came from my core, right? Sat back down next to the bed, thinking not, I mean, well, thinking a lot about it, but grateful. The flood of people who came to the door, I probably administered ashes to 40 people that afternoon and into the evening because the chaplains had not been allowed to do it that this year because of COVID or, and all of a sudden my little, and it was like the loaves and the fishes. I kept thinking, am I gonna have enough ashes? I had plenty of ashes, right? I mean, it was a teeny little thing. 40 people, I, well, I wasn't counting, but it was, it was well up there. And every one of them saw in me a priest that they needed. I didn't pretend to be a priest. I didn't, in fact, I, a couple of times said, actually, she's the priest, the one in bed, she's the priest. I'm just the lay person. You know, I didn't use the word just, but that's not, that's a particular example, Matthew, but I think it's claiming the authority of our vocations on behalf of the people of God and remembering that we are not doing it alone. The priestly piece is that we are connected to a community, a body of Christ. Mm -hmm. And so the whole liturgy that I enacted in the hospital unexpectedly was connected to a faith community from which I had been sent unknowingly, right? That's how it is when you're in the grocery store, when you're with your family, when you're at work, you are a priest in that you witness to the connection between the body of Christ and the people of God in the world. Lisa, thank you. That's, that's, <laughs> that's such a wonderful way to, for, to help us look at this. Um, I have to say, um, I've been ordained since 1994, and when I first was ordained um, to the priesthood, I served at the Cathedral of St. Philip in Atlanta, and, and we made the shift from private baptisms to public baptisms in the service, and one of the things that the, 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 that the part of the flock that was in my pastoral care wanted me, whenever I was present, whenever we had any kind of gathering, they always wanted me to pray, and I, and I said, you are the priest of this household. You all please pray. I, I'm not you know, you all can pray just as well as I can. And, and uh, about a year ago, one of my friends reminded me that I had taught her that. And she said, thank you for teaching me that. And, um, but- Andy, can I interrupt you for just a second? Because sure. I love what you're saying, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna be brave and just put a corrective in here, which is also folks, this is my lay authority coming at a priest, right? Watch right. me here. But he just said something that I know I have said, because people see me as the next thing to an ordained person because I work in the church, I work at a seminary, therefore, you know, she must know what she's doing. That phrase he just used of, you can pray just as well as I can, be careful. Yeah. We pray differently, right? Yeah. And, well, and I'm saying it to you in love because sure. when I've said that to like a lay committee in my congregation in DC, people who've never prayed out loud ever in front of somebody else, look at me like a deer in the headlights. Like they go, there's no way I can pray like you can. Yeah. So what I've learned to do is to say, God has given you a gift of prayer. And I would invite you to share that with us, even if it's in silence, right? Yeah. And so I say that only because those of us who look like we know what we're doing, whether we do or not, um, are, are sometimes guilty of our best intentions being imposed on people and actually making it harder. And I know that's not what you meant, but I, since I felt like I could say it there, 
just to remember that you, all of you on this call and everyone you have in your family of God can pray. But again, we pray differently. We have different Absolutely. levels of confidence, yes. but we want to keep cultivate. What your point is so good, which is get out of the way and allow other people to be the voice of, of priestly ministry. Absolutely. And that leads me, to, uh, Matthew and I didn't plan this, uh, our questions, I, we, we did this totally um, separate of each other, but he focused on the priestly ministry. I mean, you know, we say we, um, you know, at that great line at the end, we receive into the household of God, confess the faith of, faith of Christ crucified, um, proclaim his resurrection and share with us and his eternal priesthood, that point. But when I was doing baptism preparation, something that Rowan said in his book about it's the priestly ministry, the prophetic ministry, and the royal ministry, as Matthew mentioned, um, which um, I saw, in, at least in my teaching um, early on and continued teaching, is that we don't just baptize our children and, and, and adults and anyone in the church to have them done. Um, we, we, we baptize them for um, a role in this world. Um, for an, it's an ordination, and I've always seen my baptismal ordination as prior to my priestly ordination, um, but, I, but that the drawing on the ancient um, Hebrew tradition of royalty is that they were anointed for a purpose to administer justice in the kingdom. It was God's intention at that when those two were kind of connect, connected. Uh, and so we hope that our baptized people will sense their own ordination, their sense that, that they are proclaimed um, royal as a as not as setting them apart in a special hierarchical sense from the rest of the world but that they have a commission that this is just not about them being done it's about them sharing the ministry of justice and we all have gifts for that as you just mentioned and we all mentioned we all have to find our gifts for our ministries that we are called to proclaim in the church and that's so important um for people, you know, for parents and godparents and for even adults to understand when they're baptized and for us to keep remembering that. How can we help our folks focus on that aspect of baptism? Um, Thank you for saying that. And, and I think, I hope I was implying this in the comments I made that a congregation that is vital and takes baptismal theology seriously is always forming the life of the baptized, right? The ideal is the catechumenate, the ancient process of preparing people for adult baptism at the Easter vigil that becomes an ongoing process of then discerning with them their vocations in the life of the faith community and in the world. And they then circle back often and are sponsors for the next generation of people who will be baptized. And that culture, that cyclical culture of constantly believing that God is making things new and that we have gifts for the moment, but that we need to listen for what they are and pay attention and have the liturgical life of our community and the teaching life of our community and the outreach of our community be in sync with what God is inviting, right? So that our committees, our jobs, our, don't become static Pro, you know, programmatic structures, they're responsive, porous ways of being communities of faith within the larger community of faith. So that notion of you are, you are baptizing for a ministry is what I would say vocational discernment that needs to continue across the life course and across the life of a congregation and around the year. And there are creative ways to do it. It doesn't have to be big formal classes on vocational discernment. It just has to be the way you ask questions of each other in the coffee hour. Uh, the way you listen to what someone isn't saying between the lines. And you say, have you ever noticed that when you talk about mm -mm -mm, you smile in a way I don't see you smile otherwise? What's that about? And then let someone go, you know, you're right. I have a real enthusiasm or love for X, Y, or Z. That's probably the spirit at work in that discernment. Thank you, Lisa. And I am aware that uh, we, well, one minute away from the end time, but I'm going to make a, a probably controversial decision that I'm going to leave it open. And now uh, I want to invite everyone to, to join with your questions. And uh, I, I would love to hear from you. If, if any of you have any questions for Lisa, please unmute yourself and go for it. I have a question. Um, I think I may know the answer to this question, but let me still just put it as a question, uh, especially for Lisa about baptism. I was baptized, baptized around age nine. 
by immersion in a very fundamentalist Midwestern church. And by the time I was 12 or 13, I was direct, rejecting almost everything they stood for. Um, except Jesus and God, I was clear on those. And it was of my own volition. I mean, no one forced me to do it. There was no certain age at where it's appropriate or whatever. Even my mother, who was the one that was responsible for our being there four or five times a week, uh, she didn't push it at all. It was totally, excuse me, totally my own decision. But by the, I think the 12 or 13 is kind of when abstract thinking starts kicking in and the larger world starts, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> you know, you start seeing other things. I should say it was also a Midwestern town um, in the 50s, late 50s. So my, and of course I came to Episcopalianism very late. I've, I've been uh, at Falls Church for maybe seven years, something like that. And that and uh, confirmed about maybe two years or so into that. There's something very biblical about seven years, so that's good. Well, something, something like that. <laughs> but anyway, um, between ages 18, where I went to a congregational church, I left my I left my childhood church, went to a congregational church in that same town. Um, I never became a member of another church or it was accepted, you know, did anything, no confirmations, none of that, until I came to Falls Church. So when I first arrived there, I joked that even Moses only had to wander 40 years. I had to wander 50 years before I found my spiritual home. So I am assuming that that baptism into a faith where the, it was very narrow, very doctrinaire, very in and out, was used to build barriers between people. You either believe our way, you get baptized our way, you do everything our way, or you're going to hell. And by the way, we are sure that we are right about this. So it was used to create barriers between people. So I assume that you're going to tell me that that baptism was larger than that place and those people, and that, that God was still making a bond with me. But I just want to have your take on this, because I've kind of felt bad that I wasn't baptized Episcopalian, you know, that um, I don't even know how to use the Book of Common Prayer. Alison, thank you for that testimony um and thank you for the tenderness at the heart of it because i think you just i think we just witnessed the authenticity of your faith and the, the genuine longing of your heart for alignment you know for for walking your talk as a christian and for being in a community that sees all of you right and and takes your questions and your doubts my sense is that Falls Church Episcopal is that, and you have found your home. Yeah. And I suspect there can be more, even more from that. Uh, absolutely. Baptism is baptism is baptism. When we are baptized, God is present. And we are baptized, we believe, into the body of Christ, not into a particular denomination or a particular theological framework. And I think one of the great charges and challenges for those of us who are baptized into a more inclusive theology, into a more a, a theological structure, we can go into this forever, but that that allows for human agency. You know, we believe in scripture, tradition, and reason, right, in the Episcopal tradition, um, is that we have to take seriously traditions that practice baptism and emphasize differently the authority of the church, the authority of doctrine, the authority of God, um, that have a different understanding about salvation. And these are all theological issues, but they are translated in our bodies to how we experience church and being with other people, right? So what I would say to you is, yes, God was constantly loving you, forgiving you in your baptism at nine. And God was constantly inviting you closer. And by the grace of God and all the things that you could fill in, in with more story time, you had enough glimpses of that, that you didn't give up, right? And that you were brought closer and nearer to the love of God, not the hatred and judgment. Right. Of right. And in that, 
I would say you represent, whether you've done this or not, you represent someone who would be well served by the congregation providing preparation for, and then an intentional opportunity to reaffirm your baptismal vows in a very deliberate way um, at say the Easter vigil or at a significant feast day, All Saints, where you have done the work to feel like I'm not ashamed anymore. I, I do now understand what this Book of Common Prayer is, which is all we got as the Episcopal Church. That's, that is our creedal, that's it folks, you know, that's the thing that is our tradition writ large. So I hope you are sharing with us this morning can be an invitation to your congregation to consider, are there other LSNs who might wanna walk with you or just a sponsor who wants to walk with you to prepare for that moment when the time is right? That's a great okay. idea. Alison, and I will just uh, add to this, thank you so much for doing this. You're an incredible gift to us today. And if there is anyone among you who feels like Alison, I don't know how to do with this whole BCP, just let me know, send me an email, reach out to me. I am here for you. And I absolutely would love to do that with you. So just I would love that, yeah. Letting everyone know. Let me also say that um, I have an experience with the catechumen. I introduced the catechumen in my last parish in Alabama. And, and it's it's, we did a, we did a, a hybrid form, but I think it would be a wonderful, it's, it's, it's something amazing for you all to look at. It was a 14 week process that we had every, every person, we didn't have many people through the process who were going to be baptized as adults, but we had people who wanted to renew their baptismal covenant. We had a lot of people who wanted to be confirmed or received, but they all went through this process and everybody had a sponsor in the parish that did the journey. And then the next years, we did it for about my last seven years at Nativity, the people that had been the catechumenates the year before were all uh, most often wanting to be sponsors the next years, as you said. And it's a powerful way to share this journey and mm -hmm. to claim that it's, you know, we're, we're just not about getting done. It's just not about the bishop's hands being laid on us. It's not about um, something that, you know, was done to us a long time ago. It is an ongoing thing. It is a, it is a way to, to grow in our life in, in Christ and in God's purposes and kingdom. So, yeah. It's great. Uh, so I'm wondering I'm if we have a groundwork for us yeah. before I leave. It's a big, it's a big undertaking. <laughs> I wonder if, if we might have any more questions before we wrap up. Um, yes, I have a quite a comment and a question. First, I'd like to uh, just reinforce the notion that you brought up about discernment and how important that is to identifying the gifts and talents that God gave us to take his love and work out into the world. And the question I have is you talked about baptism and what I would call social baptism. And my question to you is, and maybe to uh, Andy and Matt as well, is how should a, a ordained minister respond to somebody who's coming in requesting what appears to be a social baptism? Because we're supposed to welcome everybody into the church. And yet if I'm putting this standard there, is that, is that appropriate? Did I hear right that you're about to be ordained? Yes. With the diaconate. Awesome. Congratulations. I'm grateful that you discerned you. that sense. Um, this is a perennial question, right? Is how do we both hold to <coughs> traditions and practices of identity construction that make us distinctively who we are called to be and set us apart from the world enough that we are on a journey that is explicitly Christian, and at the same time be so welcoming of the stranger, the, un, you know, the person who has just a tiny idea about what we're about, and, and yet is really longing for something more, right? Um, this is the, the debate about open communion. I don't know where your congregation has been in that conversation, but on the one hand, the Episcopal Church generally in the U.S. has leaned heavily in the direction of inclusion heavily in the direction of there will be no outcasts. That was a favorite phrase of a former presiding bishop, Edmund Browning, um, which is a wonderful place to be. I mean, as, as the continuum of Christian traditions in the United States goes, I would rather be recognized as one that is inclusive and welcoming and all of that, right? But the risk is when all things are welcome and there is no articulated pathway to fullness of belonging to the body of Christ, then it gets very messy because if we welcome people to communion before they're baptized and are not ripe and ready to wrap ourselves around their sense of yearning for communion 
and say, you just experienced the sacrament, the actual body and blood of Jesus Christ. How was that in your body? What did you think? What did you feel? And let's now back up and do some preparation for baptism. If we're not right there, ready to catch them in that moment of openness and possibility, I don't mean catch as in trap, but like invite, we fail because then it becomes the spiritual journey for individuals like that, who God sent to us, I believe, becomes one of individualism and one of just self-construction. Like I'll take a little bit from this tradition, a little bit from that tradition. And there's nothing wrong with those complementary voices. But what I believe is unstable is that the coherence between them is not likely to hold up under the duress of everyday life. What, what we need as people of God of any tradition is, is a sense of orthodoxy, small o, that there is an integrity, a wholeness, a connectedness to our practices and that which we claim to believe. And what I was trying to say about those desert scenes about baptism is we've got pretty far away from actually practicing as Christians in the Episcopal church, let's say, what we claim to believe. What we claim to believe is way more radical than what we practice. So Steve, I is it Steve or Stephen? I would say a clergy person's first responsibility is to love the person in front of them, right? Is to honor the Christ in that person, to recognize this is a beloved child of God already created in the image of God, and to listen deeply to their yearning, their motivation. And in that deep listening and in that deeply respectful posture, there are some sub, there's some subsequent questions that should be in your pocket. Um, you know, when they tell you just in the first conversation, you know, we need to have the child baptized on the Sunday because our in-laws are coming in from out of town and we've got the, you know, I'm making this all up, of course, we've never heard anything like this. We've got the country club booked for the reception and red flags should go up, you know, to say, have we seen them in church? Do they have a rhythm of faith in their daily life? What are we doing? We're cheapening baptism if we provide it as this, you know, social event that is actually much more tethered to a sense of social obligation, then we are tying it to a set of practices that will endure. So is there, a, is there a via media? Is there a way to say to them, we would love to welcome your in-laws. We would love to have a celebration of your extended family and to do some sharing that morning with each other in some kind of fellowship slash mentored way about what the life of Christ in this community and baptism means. And we would love to baptize your baby when you feel you are really confident that you want to walk alongside that promise. Do you look at these things you're gonna be saying in the Book of Common Prayer? We don't wanna put you up in front of the congregation and have you feel ashamed and have you feel like you're, you're saying something you're not sure you believe. If that happens by the time your in-laws are in town, hooray. But you see what I'm saying? There are, it, the big challenge for the clergy who receive these requests is the workload on the front end. There is no way around building a deeper relationship with those people. There's no way around doing some extra work. What is, I think, cruel and wrong is to say, oh, no, we can't baptize you. We have a rule in this congregation, and you have to have been here for six months. And, you know, when the legalism starts, we start to sound like the Pharisees. You need to have guidelines that you're drawing from that you and your vestry and others have discerned. But what you need to speak and what the person asking needs to hear is a pathway toward deepening relationship with God and neighbor. And each situation will be different, but it can be done. And I have, I, there's a couple of books I could point you to, but there are some wonderful stories of congregations, particularly when they've taken this catechetical rhythm seriously, taking the risk to say, we would love to baptize your child or whomever, but not yet. It feels like it could be even more and some amazing things can happen. But it's very much about discernment. You, you started with that word. Lisa, thank you so much. I, I'm Sorry, mindful I of the fact that we are a quarter of an hour later than we should be. Uh, so I want to wrap us up here. Thank you so much, Lisa, for this wonderful time with us, an introduction to this most fundamental of our sacraments, the baptism. 
And thank you for everyone joining us. Uh, I want to also mention that this is the beginning of our Lenten journey into uh, the book uh, written by Rowan Williams. We will have other speakers come and join us. Uh, also, um, throughout the week, I would love to invite you into living into this um, topic that we have just discussed. Uh, I will create also a closed Facebook group for us. If anybody would like to join that group, I will send an email about this and just share your experiences and share your thoughts, uh, reactions to, um, to what we've just heard, or even ask questions, and I'll be sure to um, answer them. And thank you so much, everyone. Thank you again to Lisa, and have a wonderful week ahead.